Over the last year, we've covered a lot of games here on Fine Game Retrospective. Some early icons, some cult classics, but it's time for us to go big. This month, King of Fighters 15 has been released, and I have seen more hype surrounding that game than any other KOF in my life. I have seen people who have never even touched an SNK game gain excited for this tile. So today, we're going to go back through the long history of this legendary franchise. A series that has given us memorable heroes, stylish villains, and some of the most broken boss fights ever. A game that has survived bankruptcy, lawsuits, and the dreaded pachinkofication. A game that under any other developer would probably have been banished to the vault ages ago, but instead has continued to return again and again with brand new characters and brand new adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, this is... Yes, folks, welcome to the King of Fighters Retrospective. Now, I know this might seem like a huge undertaking. As I said, King of Fighters 15 just came out. 15 titles? I've talked for an hour on this show about series that just had three games. How am I going to cover 15? But I think I can do it. The tiles do flow nicely into each other, so we can probably streamline all this. 15 tiles shouldn't be that much to... Oh. Right. Also need to cover the re-releases. Well, I mean, they're re-releases. They're not going to take up that much time. And oh, right, there was also an entire line of handheld games. And then all of the spin-offs. And oh, God, I forgot about the Maximum Impact line. And we have to cover the Maximum Impact line. Jesus! Yeah, okay, uh, change of plans. Welcome to part one of our King of Fires retrospective. Yes, this is going to be a four part series covering the entire history of this franchise, which is easily the biggest thing we have ever done on this channel. So if you like what you see here today and you want to help support us, then please hit that subscribe button and give us a thumbs up. It really does help us out. And as much work as this video is, it was worth it. King of Fires is an incredible series that needs more attention, so hopefully by the time all this is done, it can help fuel the excitement behind KOF, explain why it has so many diehard players, and hopefully bring in a few new fans. But we've got a long journey ahead of us here today, so let's start at the beginning. The late 80s was a booming time for the arcade industry, as anyone who could make a pixel stick figure walk across the screen was building a game around it. And SNK was one of the most experimental companies at the time. Their arcade library was massive. You want platformers? We got platformers. You want running guns? We got running guns. You want sports games? We got sports games. And of course, in 1991, they hopped on the fledgling fighting game craze with Fatal Fury. Now, if you want to know more about the history and development of that game, then check out our Fatal Fury retrospective. There's a card popping up for it right there. And just a heads up, some of the stuff in that video will be coming up in here, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. The success of Fatal Fury led to SNK's second fighting game. Art of Fighting, which was released the next year in 1992. Now, Art of Fighting was very unique, not just for mechanical reasons, being the first fighting game to ever feature super moves, but also for the story, because Art of Fighting was actually a prequel to Fatal Fury. Having a new fighting game with completely different characters be a prequel to a completely separate game is something so wild that to this day, I can't think of another example of it but that was what SNK was all about in those days. No idea was too out there for them. Especially not for Takashi Nishiyama, the creator of both Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting, as well as being co-creator of another little title that you might have heard of called Street Fighter. And when Takashi Nishiyama helped to create the first Street Fighter for Capcom, he wanted to give that game a big rich story and even wrote out extensive histories for every character. 
none of which made into the game because Street Fighter was made in 1987 and there was no way that they could put all that information into a fighting game. But when he worked on Fatal Fury, he brought that same mentality to the game and he and the developers at SNK wrote out a whole backstory for this series that was put out as promotional material in the lead up to the game's release. It was a game about Terry Bogard, a man whose father Jeff Bogard was killed by Geese Howard, a mob boss who had taken over his home of Southtown, and now Terry had returned to fight in Geese's tournament so he could get close enough to him to take his revenge. So when Art of Fighting was released, they decided to expand upon the lore of this world by having the game also be set in Southtown, but over a decade before in the 1970s. It focused on Ryo Sakazaki and his friend Robert Garcia, two students of the Kyoku Ginryu Karate Dojo. Ryo's younger sister Yuri is kidnapped by the mob enforcer Mr. Big. At the end of the game, Ryo is forced to face down Mr. Big's number one hitman, a masked man named Mr. Karate, only to learn that Mr. Karate was actually his father Takuma. Takuma reveals that long ago the true villain running things in this city had threatened his family and working for that villain was the only way to keep Ryo and Yuri safe. That true villain's name? Geese Howard. Yes, Art of Fighting was the story of the rise of Geese Howard, adding bits to the lore like having Geese try to convince Takuma to kill Jeff Bogart for him. Now, the reason why I went on that trip down two completely different games is because they formed the foundation of King of Fighters. SNK now had two different games set in the same world, so it was only a matter of time until they crossed over. And at SNK, they were tossing out ideas left and right. Originally, they wanted to make a side-scrolling beat-em-up named Downtown Team Battle, but they eventually changed that name to Survivor. And then eventually, they changed that name again to Nothing, because the idea was cancelled. But while they were brainstorming ideas for this new game, they decided to test the waters for this crossover. So in 1993, they included Ryo as a secret boss at the end of Fatal Fury Special. This was referred to as a dream match, meaning it wasn't canon, but it was met with a very positive response from the fans. This was the very first fighting game crossover, and fans went wild for it. At which point, SNK said, Wait a second, we're trying to figure out how to cross over two fighting games? Why not do a fighting game? Seems kind of obvious when you put it like that, doesn't it? You got two fighting games, set in the same location, and Fatal Fury even has an established tournament within its game as part of its story. So, let's make a fighting game, and then we just take the name of the tournament from Fatal Fury and make it the name of the entire game. The name of that tournament? You guessed it, King of Fighters. But it didn't stop there. This was the video game industry in the early 90s. This was the Wild West. Everyone was hopped up on quarters and digital sugar. This was the era of, oh, you like that? Cool, let's do way more of it. So over at SNK, after seeing the positive response to Rio and Fatal Fury Special, they said, wait. You like the idea of a crossover? Well, what if instead of crossing over two games, we crossed over all the games? So they decided this new game would be comprised of three-person teams all themed around different games from within the SNK library. And this idea went over like gangbusters. When Takashi Nishiyama and the game's director Toyohisa Tanabe pitched the idea to their team, everyone was on board, except they totally weren't and they all thought they were crazy. Yasuyuki Oda, the current head of SNK's fighting game division, joined the company right when they were starting to pitch ideas for this crossover project, and according to a Polygon interview with Oda in 2021, he said that when they initially heard the pitch for this game, nobody thought this game was going to sell. This is a game that would go on to be one of the biggest fighting game franchises in the world, and yet when Nishiyama came to them and pitched this idea, the entire SNK studio just looked at him like, This is a load of barnacles. I heard that! The biggest concern from the developers was just the size of it. They wanted this game to have 24 characters, something that was insane for the early 90s. Hell, even today that's asking a lot. But at least games today can store 24 characters. Oda's first thought when he heard this was, how the hell is this going to even function? SNK's arcade system, the Neo Geo, could not handle 24 characters, each with their own unique moves. To put that number into perspective, Street Fighter II, the biggest fighting game on the market at the time, launched with eight characters. And after multiple updates over the course of several years, every single one adding one new character on top of another, Street Fighter II brought its roster size up to a whopping 16. 
Yeah, after multiple updates, Street Fighter 2 still had a roster that was only two thirds of what this game was going to launch with. And if the massive technological hurdle wasn't enough, Tanabe and other higher ups at SNK kept making crazy requests. Things like telling them to reuse sprites from Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting to save time, which was a smart idea. Then telling them, oh, never mind, that's a dumb idea. Scrap that, make brand new sprites. Or maybe the craziest thing I have ever heard of while making this show. You know how most fighting games at the time had bonus stages? Things like breaking bricks or beating up a car? Well, they wanted King of Fighters to also have a bonus stage. So in It's All About Magazine from December of 1994, the game's two directors, Tanabe and Masanori Kuwasashi, said they asked some unnamed planner to come up with 100 bonus stages. They said that even as they gave this planner that instruction, they thought it would be impossible to do. They figured that if they told them to make 100 bonus stages, then they would come back with probably only like 10, and from that 10, at least one of them would be a good idea. But they did it. That planner actually came back with 100 different ideas for bonus stages. At which point, Tanabe and Kuwasashi told that planner, oh, uh, actually, we thought it over. Yeah, nah, let's not have a bonus stage. They're silly, nobody wants those anymore. And then proceeded to throw out all 100 ideas. God damn. I don't know who that unnamed planner was, but they must have nerves of steel because if you told me, yeah, we're going to need you to come up with 100 ideas by Monday. Then Monday rolls around and I wasted my entire weekend on this thing just so you could tell me you decided to scrap the whole project when I wasn't looking. I would burn that building down like Milton from Office Space. Okay, but I could set the building on fire. But despite, or heck, maybe even because of, the bizarre chaos engine that was SNK at the time, the team was able to pull together. According to Oda, they really gave it their all and burned the midnight oil until it was all done. Which is just a really nice way of saying they crunched and crunched and crunched. Yeah, he said in that Polygon interview that before Japan made laws against it, they would often just spend all night at the office grinding away at these games in order to get them made as quickly as possible. Which isn't exactly a healthy work environment and morally is, uh, not great. In the end, the game was able to get made and in 1994, the King of Fighters was born. King of Fires 94 was released in August of 1994. It's going to be a while before I actually have to start telling everyone the dates, isn't it? The game allowed you to choose from eight different teams, each one consisting of three fighters. Once the fight began, you would choose the order that you wanted the character to go out in, whoever won would get to stick around for the next match, and they'd gain back a chunk of their life. Now, every King of Fires would change their formula around. It would update mechanics, it would change the gameplay to keep each installment feeling unique, but this format, of having three characters, the winner moving on to fight the next character and gaining back some life, would remain the one core defining element of this series. As far as the other unique gameplay elements, like most SNK games, this was your classic four button setup. Light punch, strong punch, light kick, strong kick. And you could hit the two light buttons together to do a sidestep to dodge attacks. Now, as I mentioned, this game was meant to originally be a crossover between Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting, so when it came to the super moves, or desperation moves as they were called in these games, they tried to merge the two games together. Like in Fatal Fury, you could do a desperation move when your life points were low enough, but from Art of Fighting, they took the special meter, which could be charged up, and when that meter was full, you could also do your desperation move. But I'm going to give everyone a tip. Don't do that unless you absolutely have to. Because in addition to giving you access to an instant super, as long as your super meter is full, 
Your attacks do extra damage. How much damage? A lot. Unless you absolutely need a super to hit and you were confident that you could combo into it before your meter expired, you would have way better luck in this game just powering up and throwing out some basic kicks and punches. Now there was one other mechanic worth mentioning. You notice how your other two teammates are staying in the background? It's a really great way of showing off all the fires at once, and the animators really did a good job of giving them life. You'd see them cheering you on whenever you landed at a hit, or groaning whenever you lost, or sitting down when they've been knocked out. But they aren't just there for appearance sake. No, they actually served a mechanical purpose. If you find yourself in a throw, if you're dizzy, or if you're in some kind of emergency situation, and your teammates are in frame at the moment, then you can hit three buttons, and if you do, one of your conscious teammates can jump in to do an assist attack. Fun fact, I did not know that was a thing until I was recording footage for this video and I accidentally hit too many buttons at just the right time, and seeing my partner jump in and kick my opponent in the face nearly made me drop my controller. So that's how it played, but how does it actually feel to pick the game up? Well, it's hard to say, because you have to compare it to other titles out there at the time, and in 1994, games were a lot stiffer. But I'll say, even compared to some of the other fires at the time, this still feels a bit rigid to me. I mean, don't get me wrong, moves can link into each other, but mostly just light punches and light kicks over and over again. Although, I was constantly tempted to just throw out heavies simply because they did far more damage than the light, which I know is a big no-duh, but it's even more than you'd expect. Heck, against the bosses, the light attacks do almost nothing. In fact, speaking of damage, the desperation moves are way too strong. Just look at this! That is from one move and the match is almost done, what the hell? And this game has a lot of wonky hitboxes. It feels like if both players swing their attacks at the same time, then it's just a rock, paper, scissors game to see who actually hits, with some clear hits just going straight through the opponent. Or you'll find yourself getting hit from attacks that didn't even feel like they were close to you, like an opponent can hit you with their high anti-air attack while you're doing a leg sweep. And boy was I shocked to learn there are attacks in this game that are unsafe on hit. You connect with the attack, and they still get to punish you for it. Yeah, this game is early 90s arcade jank. But I will give it some positives. As busted as it is, it is quicker than many other games that were out there at the time, and that does make the combat kind of flow together in a way that can feel pretty nice at times. And it's a very grounded footsie-based game, with a big emphasis on fundamentals over style, which isn't for everyone, but does make this a decent game for teaching players about fighting practically. Hell, I'll admit I have a big problem with being too aggressive in my gameplay and jumping way too much, and this game taught me to stop doing that. Charging in and sending out your projectiles and jumping all over the screen, stuff like that isn't going to work in this game because f this computer! Okay, for all of our younger fans out there, let me give you a history lesson. In the early 90s, arcade games were not made to be your friends. They were made to take your quarters and fighting games were notorious for being difficult because the game could just read your inputs and know instantly how to counter them, and holy crap is this game guilty of that. Do not jump at your opponent, they will anti-air you. Do not shoot a projectile, they will jump over it. If you stand too close to your opponent, they will do a zero frame grab on you that stops almost any attack and does major damage. Heck, I won't lie, if I played through this game and the final team I went up against had Binimaru on it, one of the quickest characters in the game, I would be tempted to just quit and start all over again because the moment I hit a button, he could just get his attack out first. If you want to play against your friends, I think this game is just fine for that. A good way to relive 90s arcade classics. But if you're playing the arcade ladder, this game's AI is rough and it takes no prisoners. Especially... We'll... Get to you later. For now, let's talk about how the game looks. SNK would go on to be known for creating very impressive sprites with a lot of detail in between every single frame of animation, but as I said, this was a lot of content to cram into a single game, being made in a very short amount of time. 
So, while I think the sprites in that first game are nothing to write home about, it is pretty impressive considering what they had to work with. And one thing that I really have to give this game, and something that to me would go on to be a continuous high point in this series, were the stages. I almost never hear people talk about how good the King of Fire stages are, but I feel like it's one of the things this series keeps knocking out of the park, game after game. They're always so varied, so full of life, you really feel the excitement and the hype surrounding this tournament from the crowds cheering you on in the background, and they are loaded with so many cameos. The whole point of a crossover is to feel like these worlds are being brought together, and when you see not just the Fatal Fury characters fighting, but their whole stage is loaded with guest characters from that series, it makes you feel like these games exist together. I mean, that might not mean a lot to someone new to this franchise, but if you're a big SNK nerd, then these stages will have you constantly stopping and pointing out, Oh hey! It's Duck King, you guys! Look! Look, it's Duck King, everyone! Duck King! So we got the gameplay, we got the graphics, let's actually crack open this roster and look at the characters who kicked this whole thing off. Now, as I said, even though the King of Fires had been held before in the Fatal Fury games, this year the tournament took on a unique new rule where everyone would have to fight on teams of three, so these 24 characters were divided into eight teams. First off was Team Fatal Fury. I already brought up Terry Bogard, the legendary Hungry Wolf. He's a down-to-earth guy who likes hot dogs and hamburgers, and he's constantly playing basketball with the kids in Southtown to be a good role model to them. And of course, he can summon out the power of the Earth to cause explosions, and has sworn revenge against a crime boss named after a waterfowl. Then there's Andy Bogard, Terry's brother, who is far more strict and professional than his big bro, and he spent the last decade training in the armed ninjutsu. And lastly, Joe Higashi, he's a skilled fighter who's won multiple Muay Thai championships, but he's not exactly as bright as his teammates, and he's got terrible luck finding dates, and those two things combined have made him the constant source of comedic relief on Team Fatal Fury. Next up, the other half of this crossover coin, the whole reason SNK won to make this game to begin with, Team Art of Fighting. There's Ryo, the Invincible Dragon. The young master of Kyoku Ginryu Karate, who is maybe a bit too dedicated to his training, so much so they can come off as aloof at times. Then there's Ryo's friend and the secondary protagonist of the Arfine games, Robert Garcia, the Raging Tiger. Son of a wealthy Italian businessman, he came to America to train under Ryo's father and found himself to be a natural martial arts master. He's often portrayed as being more jokey and passionate than Ryo, which along with his crush on Ryo's sister Yuri are often used as a source of comedy. And lastly, there's Ryo's father, Takuma, who is your typical strict sensei. He's always pushing his students hard and making them train every chance that they get. Now, this is an important thing that we have to bring up. Some of you might be wondering, hey wait, you said Art of Fighting was set over a decade before Fatal Fury. Why do the Art of Fighting characters look exactly the same? Yeah, this is something that you need to understand before you try and fit this game into the Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting canon. This game does not fit into the Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting canon. Yes, Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting exist in its own timeline, and King of Fighters is in a completely different timeline. So, does that mean that the events of Art of Fighting and Fatal Fury didn't happen in this world? No. And... yes. And no. Sort of? Some events of the Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting games did happen in the King of Fighters universe, but not necessarily in the same way, and other events didn't happen at all. Basically, think of it like this. You know how when you watch a movie based on a comic book, some of the stuff in that comic book movie did happen in the comics, but not in the same way? Same thing here. Fatal Fury is Terry Bogard in the comics, King of Fighters is Terry Bogard in the movies. And in case you're wondering what events did overlap exactly, well, there's never been a full-blown timeline written out, but most fans believe the events of Art of Fighting 1 still happen, just in the modern day, but then after that, whether or not the events of Art of Fighting 2 and 3 happen is kinda up in the air, and if they did happen, they certainly didn't happen in the same way, considering Geese Howard's role in Art of Fighting 2 and certain character developments that happened in Art of Fighting 3. And as for Fatal Fury, again, no official timeline, but most fans believe that the events of Fatal Fury 1 through 3 all happened, so Terry beat Geese in an earlier King of Fires tournament, knocked him off his tower to his supposed death, then fought Geese's brother Krauser, then Geese returned thanks to the power of some mystic scrolls. However, the events of the real bout games where Terry beat Geese and he fell to his death for real, that didn't happen in the King of Fires universe. Geese Howard is still seen alive and kicking in the King of Fighter games long after his death in the Fatal Fury timeline. So, 
there you have it. The Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting crossover that SNK always wanted to make. It was a long road to bring this about, but it was finally here. Meaning that now we can move on to the next year when SNK would go on to develop- Wait a second! We've still got 18 more characters to cover! Why the hell did I just spend three minutes talking about continuity? We need to keep this show moving! Next up, Team Psycho Soldiers. The two main characters on this team were Athena Asamiya and Sai Kinzo, both of whom came from the action game Psycho Soldiers, released in 1986. This game was a sequel to their earlier arcade hit, Athena, which was all about a goddess who bowed creatures of darkness thousands of years ago. But in Psycho Soldiers, Athena Asamiya is a young girl who wanted to become a pop star in modern day Japan, but when those same ancient creatures started to return, she and her friend Kinzo had to use their psychic powers to save their hometown. Now, just like Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting's cast, these two saw some pretty big changes. They were both still psychics, but now Athena wasn't a pop star in training, she was actually already a famous idol. And Kinzo is not only her childhood friend, but he's also her number one groupie constantly cheering her on, as well as eternally attempting to ask her out and failing. You may have figured it out by now, but SNK really has a thing for that running gag. But that wouldn't be Kinzo's only recurring joke, SNK really loves poking fun at this guy, either from him attempting to look cool and failing, or his obsession with eating meat buns. Now as for the third member of their team, this was an entirely new character, Chen Ginsai, and boy is one of these things not like the others. Yeah, the old drunk slob doesn't exactly fit in next to the two perky high school kids. How do you do, fellow kids? What? But he's actually Athena and Kinzo's master, helping to train them with their psychic abilities. And on his own, Chin is a master of the drunken fist, and if you're a big Chinese martial arts cinephile, then you might recognize his design. He was based off the depiction of So Chan in the 1978 Drunken Master film, and the inspirations from that movie didn't stop there. Kinzo received a drastic redesign for this game, with his inspiration being taken from Jackie Chan's character in the same film. Which could possibly be why Kinzo became more comedic since Jackie Chan's films were often praised for being more lighthearted and funny than other martial arts films at the time. And Athena herself received her own redesign, and many have actually theorized that based off of Chin and Kinzo's designs, that she might have been inspired by Pan Pan Yung's character in the Drunken Master sequel, Story of the Drunken Master, but I don't know. I can kind of see it, but it's a bit of a stretch for me. Either way, the design one stick as Athena would go on to be one of the most redesigned characters in fighting game history, gaining a completely different look in almost every single game. Next up, Team Ikari Warriors, made up of Ralph Jones, Clark Still, and Hydern, all from the Ikari Warrior games, which was a series of run and gun and beat em up games from the 80s where you play as soldiers storming into enemy bases and blowing up and punching everything in your way. Now in the first game, Ralph and Clark were pretty much just copies of each other, both in personality and their moves. The only real difference between the two of them were their desperation attacks, with Ralph's being a string of exploding punches, and Clark tossing the opponent into the air for a triple backbreaker. And while that might not seem like a huge difference, it was from these supers that their individual playstyles would slowly evolve, with Clark being a more dedicated grappler and Ralph being more of a big punch man. Also, as the games would go on, their personalities would become more distinct, with Clark becoming the serious straight man of the group and Ralph being more of the big man on campus cocky jock character. Then there was their boss, Hyder, a mysterious eyepatch man and expert tactician who likes to fight with extremely deadly jabs and slashes. In later games, Hydern would go on to almost be a Nick Fury figure for the series, a character in the shadows constantly gathering intel and making plans against the new big enemy of the game. Next up, Team Women Fighters, which, as you can guess from the name, is comprised of some of the most popular female characters from SNK's library. There's the leader of the group, King, a Muay Thai master who originally appeared in the Art of Fighting games as a bouncer working for Mr. Big, but she was only working for the villain to help raise money for her younger brother's operation. After losing to Ryo, however, she decided to finally turn on Mr. Big, and despite her villainous origins, King is actually a very kind and compassionate person who looks after her teammates while being stern and serious when facing her opponents. Unless that opponent is Ryo, who she totally has a thing for, and Ryo, after two decades, still doesn't quite get it. Then there's Yuri, the younger sister of Ryo, who, after being kidnapped by Mr. Big, decided to start training under her father, and it turns out she was a natural, mastering some of the more complicated techniques of Kyoku Ginryo after only a year. She's got an energetic, upbeat attitude that has made her a big fan favorite in the series. And then, of course, there's Mai Shiranui. She's the daughter of the man who trained Andy Bogart, and during his training, she developed a massive crush on him, with her infatuation bordering on obsession. But beyond the fact that she flirts with Andy Bogart so much he could give Pepe Le Pew a run for his money, 
Maya also has a very playful, fun-loving attitude that has made her one of the most iconic characters in SNK's entire library. She has also been so excessively sexualized over the years that she's the only character to ever be banned from Smash Bros. So, uh, yeah, that's something I had to bring up. Now, Team Women Fires has been one of the longest-running teams in this series, and I do think the idea of having an excuse to bring whatever cool female characters you can think of into this game is a great idea, but honestly, I always hated that name. It just sounds like a placeholder, like, what do we call this team made up of women fighters? Uh, Team Women Fighters? Uh, I don't know, just put that down, we'll think of something better later. And I feel like even SNK doesn't really like that name. In the King of Fighters anime, they didn't even refer to themselves as Team Women Fighters. Instead, they called themselves Team Queen. Luckily, in King of Fighters 15, they finally did change that name to something better, but it's going to be a long time before we get to that game. Now, for the final pre-existing character from Fatal Fury, Kim Kapwon created his own team called Team Korean Justice. Kim Kapwon was a Taekwondo master who had an over-the-top dedication to justice and believed that martial arts was the way to spread justice throughout the world. One day, he finds out that a violent criminal, Chang Koihan, has escaped from prison. So, he tracks him down and easily beats him and returns him to his cell. Later, when walking home, Kim was attacked by a serial killer, Choi Boonj, who Kim easily dispatched. But it was then that he got a brilliant idea, and by brilliant, I mean insane. He would take Chang and Choi under his wing and force them to undergo his rigorous training, all in the effort to reform them through the power of Taekwondo. Throughout the history of this series, this has been a recurring team with a running gag being that Chang and Choi keep trying to escape, only for Kim to stop them and then put them through his hellish train regimen all over again. As for how they play, Kim fights with a flurry of quick kicks, Chang is your big slow wall who hits hard, and Choi is... just the worst. Yeah, I'm sure some people might not have any problems with him, but that hitbox and his crazy jumping and spitting patterns have been the bane of my existence throughout this series. Your punches will go right over him, and he will drill claw you for days. Speaking of Choi, in case you're looking at those claws and hat of his thinking, huh, could he possibly have been inspired by Freddy Krueger? Don't worry, it's not your imagination. The reference was very much intentional. In fact, originally, Choi was going to have a striped sweater, but they changed it for fear of being sued, and prepare to hear the phrase, they changed it for fear of being sued, many more times over the course of this series. Yeah, SNK is famous for a lot of things, and blurring the line between homage and ripoff is one of them. Need some other examples? Let's move on to our next team, the American Sports Team. This was one of the only completely original teams with no influence from previous sources. There was Heavy D, a boxer, Lucky Glover, a basketball player, and Brian Battler, a football player. Now as for their inspirations, Lucky Glover was based off of Hakeem in Bruce Lee's Game of Deaths, who was played by real-life basketball legend Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Brian Battler, while being completely original, did have uniform colors that were similar to the box art of SNK's game Football Frenzy, so it is possible that while he wasn't taken from that game, he was meant to be a subtle reference to it. And as for Heavy D, yes, his name is 100% just taken straight from the rapper Heavy D of Heavy D and the Boys. And I know you might be thinking, wow, they didn't even try on that one. The sad thing is, they actually did. In that All About KOF 94 article that I mentioned earlier, developers behind this game said that to keep from getting into legal trouble, they added the exclamation point to the end of his name so that way it would be different. Oh yeah, that's brilliant, I'm sure it fooled everyone. SNK, you had, and I cannot stress this enough, just the worst legal advice I've ever heard. Now I'll admit, I like the American sports team. I dig Heavy D's design, and he's got some good punches. Lucky Glover, sure he's got one of the worst projectiles in the history of fighting games, but he's got some good mobility. And Brian Balor, you can't get me to hate a big man who flies by twirling his arms around like he's trying to turn into a helicopter. And I think they've got one of the best themes in the entire game, and I love their stage. It is loaded with random cameos from American celebrities that are just legally distinct enough to not get them in trouble. But SNK has done everything in their power to turn these guys into a running gag, and I don't mean like the Joe Higashi Sai Kenzo, oh, aren't these characters funny running gags? No, more of the we hate these characters and we're going to take every opportunity we can get to crap all over them kind of gags. Yeah, if there is an opportunity for SNK to make the Team American Sports team the butt of a joke, they are going to take it. There are multiple King of Fighters and King of Fighters spinoff games where it's actually part of the story that a character joined the cast, 
because they stole an invitation from the American sports team. Like, damn, there's no need for that, but SNK hates these characters and they want to make sure that you do too. Even a few years ago, when an anime was made based around King of Fires 94, the American sports team was the only team not to get any dialogue as they were immediately brainwashed by the big villain and were just there to be fodder for the heroes to show off their skills. All right, the heroes. Yes, the final team of this game was another completely original collection of characters who would go on to be the face of this series and the protagonist of this first storyline. Team Japan, or as they would later be known, Team Hero. You've got the original protagonist of the series, Kyo Kusanagi. He's a young high school fighting superstar who comes from the Kusanagi clan, a long line of martial artists with the power to create flames. Kyo is one of those characters that you can tell was created just to be cool, but he's one of the rare examples where that actually worked. I know it's all a matter of opinion, but Kyo feels to me like one of the most likable fighting game protagonists. He's a bit cocky, he's got a swagger to him, but he's not an arrogant jerk. He's not some rebellious kid who ignores his family's responsibilities. He's easygoing, but he still takes his training seriously, all while enjoying life as a typical high school student. His teammates include Binimaru Nikaido, a professional model who trained in martial arts and has harnessed the power of electricity. Binimaru is fairly suave, or at least he likes to think that he is, and is constantly flirting or making jokes to keep the situation light. No matter what's going on, Binny always keeps his spirits high. And lastly, probably the polar opposite of Binimaru in terms of character design and personality, Goro Daimon. In contrast to his two teammates, Goro is a man of few words. He's a very stern-faced and strict athlete and a judo champion. The three of them fit pretty well as the protagonists of this game because not only do they all have three very different personalities that are great to see bouncing off of each other, but speaking in terms of gameplay, you've got your all-rounder, you've got your rushdown, and then you've got your grappler. It's a three-person team that's set up so that no matter what your playstyle is, they've got you covered. Now, looking at these three, if you're anything like me, your first question is going to be, what the heck is up with Benny Mars' hair? And the simple answer is, his electricity keeps his hair standing up. But if you want the actual answer, it's because Benny Mar is another character that took heavy inspiration from another source, specifically Paul Narev from Johto's Bizarre Adventure. And if you look at these two, it's not just the hair. It's the shirt, it's the pants. Again, SNK, you were really playing fast and loose with that fair use clause, weren't you? But it could have been worse. Oh, it could have been so much worse. Because Kyo Kusanagi, that's a unique design. That's an original character right there. But he started life as a character named Tsuo Kirishima. And his design was just kind of from Akira. And if you think I might be exaggerating a bit on that, take a look at the Japan stage. Parts of this set were taken directly from shots in Akira. And the game's graphic designer, Mitsuo Kodama, made several other references to Akira in other games he worked on at SNK. Man, can you imagine if they had gone with Kyo's initial design? Can you imagine how much trouble SNK would have gotten into if a character in this game had a design that was just taken directly from Akira? That would have been terrible for this company, and they would have been crazy to do that, and I'm sure I am in no way foreshadowing something that will be coming up in part two of this series. And those weren't even going to be the only references to Akira that they initially had planned in this game, which brings me to a segment that I like to call, What Got Cut? <music> yes, when it comes to fighting games, there's tons of content that always gets left on the cutting room floor, but when it comes to King of Fighters, there are like five or six different versions of this game that we could have gotten. First off, the characters were originally going to have dynamic intros, win, and loss animations, but that had to be cut due to technical limitations. And originally, Kyo was going to come riding in and skid to a halt on a motorcycle, just like you know who. In fact, if you look at the Team Japan stage, you can even see Kyo's bike right there, another great example of how they use these stages to fill in information on these characters. The wildest example of that is that originally, if Kyo lost the match on the Japan stage, his girlfriend Yuki would come running in and huddle over him. But again, technical limitations made that impossible, so they decided to put her in the background right there. Yeah, that's not some random blurry sprite. Tanami confirmed in that All About Magazine interview that this was his girlfriend. 
Again, I mentioned that Nishiyama believed in creating huge worlds and stories behind his fighting games and would often write out giant bios around these characters, including their families and friends, so this was the first appearance of Kyo's girlfriend Yuki, who would go on to be a major plot point in a later game and would even be playable as a secret character in the portable SNK Gals Fighters. Side note, I really hope I never have to do a fighting game retrospective on SNK Gals Fighters. There actually are multiple installments of that franchise and it gets weird. Oh, but the cut content train keeps rolling from there. Originally, Kim Kapwan was not going to be in this game at all, and Chang and Joy were going to be joined by a third criminal as Team Fugitive, something that would be later revisited in King of Fighters 14. Another thing that was cut, or at least cut for certain versions of this game, when this game was originally released in America, it was heavily censored as they cut out the blood effects and removed several frames of animation from Mai to keep her from being so... Um... Mobile? Yeah, let's, let's go with that. That sounds like it won't get me demonetized. These days, if you buy the game digitally, you'll get the uncensored version. But when the arcade game was first released, SNK's Japan branch said that they did program a code into the arcade machines that if you entered it, would put the censored content back in, but only the staff at SNK America knew this code and they promised to take the code to their graves. Which is just hilarious to me. I can't get over the idea that Mai was so dangerous to 1994 audiences that two guys at SNK would have to enter in a passcode and then turn their keys at the same time in order to unlock her full power. Sir, we are unlocked. Turn your keys! Sorry, I'm so sorry. Turn your keys, sir! Be crazy! Mai, whoa! Perfect! And speaking of Mai, one of the wildest bits of cut content Originally, Team Women Fighters didn't exist at all. Instead, this was originally going to be Team England, made up of King, Billy Kane, Geese Howard's right-hand man, and Big Bear, a wrestler who used to work for Geese as well, but had become a good guy. For about five seconds before becoming a villain again. Yes, originally, there was going to be a Team England, despite the fact that King is from France. And Big Bear is from Australia, so... I guess it was more like... Team Europe and former European colonies. Yeah, that doesn't really roll off the tongue as well. But as they were working on this game, Art of Fighting 2 came out, and in that game, Yuri went from being the damsel in distress to being a playable character, and the staff fell in love with her. The directors of King of Fighter just had to include her now. So they started looking for people that they could remove, and because of his size, Big Bear was giving them all kinds of technical headaches. So they decided to scrap him, but now they had a team of Yuri, King, and Billy Kane. And while the old Team England might have made little sense, this new team made no sense. So they had to think of a new theme to tie them all together, and they said, Hey, wait, Yuri's a woman, King's a woman, let's kick Billy off and then put that my character everyone seems to love on this team, and now boom, Team Women Fighters. Yeah, I said I didn't really like the name Team Women Fighters because it sounded like a last minute idea. Turns out that's exactly what it was. But hey, we're better off for it. King Yuri and Mai are great, and over the course of the last three decades, this team has brought so many amazing characters into the spotlight. Meanwhile, if we had stuck with Team England, then we could have gotten SNK legends like... Um... Oh, Bijini. She could have been in there. Or, um... Kisara Westfield from Aggressors of Dark Combat. That... That was a game for uh, this guy named Matlock. Yeah, Team Women Fighters was definitely the right call. Now, after you fight your way through the roster, your team is then summoned to an aircraft carrier, the Black Noah, where you meet the leader of this tournament, Rugal Bernstein, a man who looks like if an 80s soap opera villain put his brain into Hulk Hogan's body. He's a weapons dealer whose goal in life is to fight the strongest combatants on the planet and then turn them into bronze statues for his trophy room. And if you look closely, and by that I mean it's right in front of your face, you can see that this room is loaded with references to other fighting games, especially Street Fighter. You can see clear statues of Zangief, Akuma, and especially Gao right there dead center. Now, the original King of Fighters didn't have a lot of story to it, but it is worth pointing out that each team does get a little bit of unique interaction with Rugal right before the fight, many of which did add some backstory to these characters. For example, if you're playing as Team Akari Warriors, then Rugal comments that he was the one that took Hydern's eye and killed his family. And for Team Japan, when you arrive at the fight, you find Kyo's father Saishu already defeated and apparently even killed by Rugal. 
From there, the battle starts aboard Rugal's ship, and there's a couple of things that I enjoy about this boss fight. The stage is good. I like that despite not having any teammates, Rugal's pet panther is just standing in his corner for him, and Rugal's theme is one of the best in the entire game. But none of that matters because if you know anything about King of Fighters, you've probably heard horror stories about Rugal. He is notorious for his massively damaging attacks and punishing counters. But honestly, he's not all that tough. When the boss fight begins, he mostly just stands there, menacingly. Just relax, charge up your power meter for extra damage, get some good pokes in, and he's done. For stage one, that is. Because at this point, he throws off his shirt, the true sign that any villain has gotten serious, and he becomes way more aggressive and starts pulling out moves like a full screen charge, a projectile reflector, and of course, his most notorious attack, the Genocide Cutter, a rising leg sweep that counters everything. And when he's charged up at full power, that thing can nearly one-shot some characters. And it's not even a super! He can just do it whenever he wants! And the crazy thing is, he was originally going to be even more broken. Because the original premise was since Rugal takes fighters he defeats and collects them like trophies, Rugal was going to be able to take moves from whatever characters he defeated and use them against your remaining team members. But again, it was cut due to technical limitations. Yeah, there was no way they could program that many moves into this one character when this entire game was already pushing its technical limitations to the breaking point. But they did come up with a compromise by giving him Geese Howard's Rapukin from Fatal Fury and Wolfgang Krauser's Kaiser Wave from Fatal Fury 2, implying that Rugal was so tough he could take out two other SNK bosses no problem. In fact, speaking of SNK bosses, for anyone out there unfamiliar with King of Fighters and this is your first time looking into this series, there is a term you're going to need to become familiar with. SNK Boss Syndrome. This is a popular term in the fighting game community to describe when a boss fight takes a massive leap in difficulty to the point of feeling broken, and this is maybe the earliest example of it. When you finally do win the match, Rugal pulls a con and decides to blow his ship up to try and take you with him. Luckily, your team escapes, and again, there really isn't much of any story here. Pretty much all the team endings are the same. They all just decide, well, guess that's over. The only real exception is that with Team Fatal Fury, you do get a nice cameo from Geese and Krauser promising their revenge, and with Team Akari Warriors, Hydern tosses out a picture of his family as if to say they finally avenged them. And that's it. That is how this franchise started. But when SNK saw the reception of this game, they realized it couldn't be where the series ended. This was a smash hit. A month after the game came out, Gamus Magazine claimed it was the second most popular arcade game in Japan. And later that year, Electronic Gaming Monthly named it the best fighting game of 1994, meaning it beat out Killer Instinct, Children of the Atom, Virtua Fighter 2, and Tekken. And so, SNK decided to bring it back next year, and as you will soon see, the game didn't add much, but what it did add would change the course of the series forever. King of Fighters 95 came out in July, less than a year after the last game was released, and I'd like to reiterate, SNK was pumping out games at this time, pushing them to come out faster and harder, not stopping for any reason, no matter how much they might have wanted to. Don't get me wrong, when I listen to the developers talk about the games today, they say it was a fun time working on them. But remember that interview with the two game directors, Tanabe and Kuwasashi, in All About Magazine? At the end of it, they asked the two directors, since KOF 94 was received so well, can we expect KOF 95 next year? To which they replied, that's what we were afraid you'd ask. Right now, we're considering it, it all depends on the player response. At which point the interviewer pushed them further on this and asked, if you were to start on a version for 95 now, it seemed like it would be a really tight development schedule. To which the directors replied, that's why we really don't want to think about it. 
Yeah, King of Fighters 95 came out in July, and this interview was done in December, just seven months earlier, and they still hadn't started working on the game yet. And when you look at the final product, you can tell they didn't have a lot of time for development. But that doesn't mean the game is bad. Usually if you hear that a game has a seven month long development cycle, it means the game is going to be glitchy and low with bugs. I mean, dear God, just saying the phrase seven month development cycle gives me a headache. But King of Fighters 95 actually plays pretty well. And there's a reason for it. King of Fighters 95 is just King of Fighters 94, but with a patch. Yeah, as I said, gameplay-wise, King of Fighters 94 had some things going for it, but it also had share of problems. I mean, they had to make the game with a record-breaking number of characters in roughly the span of a year. It's a miracle it worked at all. But in King of Fighters 95, they didn't really change much. The roster is almost completely the same, the sprites are pretty much direct ports, and each pre-existing character did get one or two new moves, but outside of that, it was basically the exact same game. Except... Everything now flowed together so much better. Don't get me wrong, this still feels like an early 90s fighting game, but compared to King of Fighters 94, the moves feel more natural. They can link together better. You can cancel certain actions into others that you couldn't before. There's no other way to put it, King of Fighters 95 is just a better version of King of Fighters 94. It feels like what happens when you take a rush game and then give those developers seven more months to work on it. And that compliment especially goes for the game's AI difficulty. Again, if you want to play against your friends, it's good. For 95, it's a pretty solid game. But against the computer? Oh my goodness, the difficulty feels way more balanced. It's still hard, I will admit, it's still a game designed to take your quarters. It is still far more difficult than most modern day fighting game arcade ladders, but doesn't feel just broken. In King of Fighters 94, I tried playing the difficulty on hard, medium, and easy, and it barely changes. Easy difficulty feels almost the same as hard. In King of Fighters 95, yeah, it's still tough, but easy mode is at least easier than normal mode. Normal mode is easier than hard. It feels like someone actually tried to balance this thing. It doesn't feel like a complete mess. And there were several updates that just made sense. I mentioned that when you beat a character in the last game, you would gain some life back before going on to the next match. But when I went back to play that game, I was stunned at how much life you gain. It is a solid chunk no matter what happens. In King of Fighters 95, and for every game after this, the amount of life that you gain back would depend on how much time was left on the clock, which was great. It meant that if you knew you needed more life to take on the next enemy, you'd try to finish the match faster so that way you could gain more back. Or if you knew that there was no way for you to beat your current opponent, you could try to stall and run out the clock so that way when they eventually did win, they would gain back very little life when they went on to face your next character. This added a huge level of strategy to King of Fires and makes me watch the clock in these games just as closely as I watch my life bar. And there were several other important adjustments as well. There isn't a country mile between the strength in your light attack and heavy attack, and when you charge up your meter, you do get a power boost, but it's not so huge that just powering up is your entire strategy. And most importantly, you were no longer confined to pre-made teams. This is probably the biggest change 95 made to the gameplay. You can now mix and match fighters to your heart's content, and it gave the game a massive amount of variety. It's probably the reason why this game has developed such a strong competitive scene around it. You can face a hundred opponents, and none of them would use the same combination of characters. And again, I have to stop and point out how good the stages look. There's a few that aren't winners, but most of them really impressed me. Fine in front of the giant Neo Geo store on the Team Japan stage, which would go on to be a staple stage for this series. The art of fighting stage, where for the first several seconds you have to duke it out in this cramped elevator as it rides up, only for the stage to then open up once you hit the top floor. Or my personal favorite, the Fatal Fury stage, where you start by jumping off a dock and the fight is then in this shallow water, and that water looks great for 1995. And of course, I have to mention this guy in the background, who is clearly feeling himself more than any man in video game history. That man's funk levels are through the roof. And the sound design in this game is noticeably better. There are some voice lines that do sound too compressed, but the sound effects really stand out. The clanking under your feet when you're jumping on this metal bridge, the crackling fire and lightning on Kim's stage, and of course, the slapstick booty bump sound effect from Yuri that sounds like it came straight out of a Warner Brothers cartoon. Also, one last thing that I have to point out about KOF 95. 
SNK was famous in the 90s for having the corniest fighting game dialogue ever. Everyone remembers Fatal Fury and the Wubba Wubba I'm in the pink today boy, but that stuff was in all their fighting games, especially KOF. And this was the game where that really started to kick in, and I love it. Stuff like Goro Diamond stopping to mention that he loves bowling for no reason, or so many obvious attempts to try and replicate the corny dialogue of 80s American action films, it's good old classic SNK cheesiness. Nobody did lame insults better than SNK back in the day. Now as for the cast of characters, because of time and technical limitations, they could only add one new team, Team Rivals. But 24 characters was already pushing it for a Neo Geo system, so if they were going to add one new team, that of course means they had to get rid of one old team. But oh, who to pick? Who to get rid of? Fatal Fury? No, 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 they're too popular. Team Women Fighters? No, people love that team. Ikari Warriors? No, no, they're too important to the plot. Who, oh, who are we going to get rid of? Yep, yeah, remember how he said SNK proceeded to turn the American sports team into a joke? This is when that began. The official canon of this game is that everyone who was originally in King of Fighters 94 was invited to come back for King of Fighters 95, but then Team Rivals proceeded to beat the crap out of the American sports team and took their invites. And the American sports team would never make it back into another canonical King of Fighters. They really should not have given up their lucrative sports careers to become Street Fighters. Now, as I said, the new team was called Team Rivals, and as you can imagine from that name, they were primarily designed to serve as the villain team. The cast was made up of Billy Kane, the loyal right-hand man to Geese Howard and Constant Thorn Terry Bogart's side. Then there was Aiji Kisaragi, a character who first appeared in Art of Fighting 2. He was a ninja whose family had a long-running rivalry with Ryo's Kyoku Genryu school. And lastly, the leader of the team and the only completely brand new character in KOF 95, Iori Yagami. Iori was a bloodthirsty, borderline sociopathic villain who would just as gladly turn on his allies than work beside them, but sadly, he wasn't always like that. Iori used to be a successful musician, playing bass in a jazz band, and he despised violence. But then his powers activated. You see, the Yagami clan possessed a firepower just like the Kusanagi's, except their flames were purple. And I'll get into why all that is in more detail later, but the Yagami and the Kusanagis had been in a blood feud for generations, and once his powers activated, Iori had one goal, to kill Kyo and anyone that got between them. Now when SNK was doing location tests for this game, the players they surveyed were all behind Iori. He was a smash hit, people loved his aggressive playstyle, his Rekka attacks, his iconic laugh. <laughs> And especially his design, everyone praised this character for his style. I mean, just listen to this glowing testimony from this young upcoming game developer. But when I first saw this character in the game at the time, due to his look and attitude, I thought, whoever created this character must be a genius. Best of luck to that guy, I hope he goes far. Also, not to jump ahead too far, but Iori is another great example of how these characters do change and grow over the course of these games as his backstory would end up getting fleshed out over the next few games, and would later go from being a villain to more of an anti-hero. Now, even though that was the only new team, just like with the first game, there was a lot that was pitched that ended up getting left out. So you know what that means, it's time again for... Well, shockingly enough, as popular as he was and as important as he would be to this series moving forward, originally Iori wasn't going to be in the game at all and the third member of Team Rivals was going to be Roddy Burtz, a bounty hunter from Art of Fighting 3. The funny thing about that is, Art of Fighting 3 wouldn't be released until 1996, meaning if they had gone through this, Roddy Burtz would have been introduced in a crossover game before the game he was actually meant to debut in. More than likely, this is why they decided to hold off on Roddy and instead create Iori to be a counter to Kyo, and because of that, we ended up getting one of the most legendary rivals in fighting game history, and Roddy was never heard from again. Next up, another team that was meant to be introduced in this game was Team Bosses, with Geese, Krauser, and Mr. Big. But they were cut, probably because they didn't want to take attention away from the rivals team as the new villains. Although, speaking of the Geester and his brother, in what is easily the most disturbing bit of cut content we're going to talk about today, or possibly ever, Originally, the final boss of this game wasn't just going to be Rugal, it was going to be Rugal 
fused with geese and Krauser to create a brand new entity called Rugal Infinity. And maybe I'm just speaking for me here, but I'm really glad they couldn't put that one in the game. Sometimes cut content should remain cut content. The concept art alone is going to be stuck in my brain for the rest of my life. I don't really know if I ever wanted to actually fight Cronenberg Rugal. And lastly, and maybe the biggest shocker, originally there was going to be a Team Samurai Showdown, comprised of Halmaru, Nakaruru, and Galford. But according to that Polygon interview with Oda, they cut the team because only two Samurai Showdown games had been made at this point, and they still weren't confident that these characters were going to end up becoming popular. Yeah, not because logically these characters would have to have existed hundreds of years before the events of King of Fighters, but because they didn't know if Samurai Showdown, the series that would become SNK's second biggest fighting game franchise, would be a hit. I feel like I should point out right now that when King of Fighters 94 was made, Art of Fighting also only had two games, and that was enough to create this entire crossover. But one year later, Sam Show having two games wasn't enough to get them in the door. However, it is worth pointing out that the next year, when King of Fighters 95 got a Game Boy port, they did add Nakaruru in there as a guest character, which might have come about as a result of this team being cut. Now, as you make your way through the arcade ladder, you'll occasionally get glimpses of Rukal, revealing himself to still be alive, and now he's got a mysterious new partner waiting for you. It turns out that Kyo's father, Saishu, didn't die in the last game. Instead, Rukal took his unconscious body and brainwashed him to fight against you. Originally, Saishu was meant to have died in King of Fighters 94, but when the game got a sequel, they figured it would be fun to surprise the audience by bringing him back as a mid-boss, as well as a way to flesh out Kyo's character. And this would go on to kind of be the formula for every King of Fighters after this. There would always be the big bad at the end of the game, but before you could get to them, you would always have to face a sub-boss. Once you defeat Saishu, he comes back to his senses for just a moment before Rugal steps in. And over the last year, Rugal has undergone some changes. I'd imagine having an aircraft carrier blow up in your face would do that to a man. He now has a robotic arm, pale skin, and he somehow figured out a way to go Super Saiyan. This is Omega Rugal, a version of Rugal who is overflowing with some strange dark energy, and you have to fight him inside of his secret base where he's arming a missile, implying that if you don't beat him, then he's going to launch it and destroy... I really don't know, it's never actually addressed. I don't even know if Rugal owns this base, but damn if it isn't a cool saying for a final fight. However, as intimidating as he is, I still think original recipe Rugal from KOF 94 was tougher for one simple reason. Omega Rugal isn't flat out broken. Yeah, remember I said the original KOF is notorious for having a busted AI that just reads all of your inputs and does disgusting amounts of damage? So while Omega Rugal has all of old Rugal's moves, some even being faster and having flashier effects, I never lost my mind over this fight. I never started to rage against it and start pulling out my hair because the original Rugal fight felt like you need a lot of skill and a lot of luck. It felt like you could really only beat that match if the computer just decided to not counter you at the exact right moment. KOF 95 feels like you need a lot of skill, but just a little bit of luck. It feels like if you actually are good at this game, then you can beat it. And when you do beat it, Rugal calls you a jerk, which always makes me laugh, but then he explodes as his power erupts out of him. And this is when things get interesting. Now I mentioned way back at the start of this video that the producer of this game, Takashi Nishiyama, won their games to have rich stories behind them. And now that it was clear that King of Fighters was going to be an annual thing, they decided to map out a massive tale for this franchise. And this weird new power that Rugal has, the way it just bursts out of him in a flash of a skull, left some of the heroes with questions. And in Team Japan's ending, it's revealed that Kyo's father survived the fight and was now watching his son from a distance. And he warned that something was coming. Something that the Kusanagi family had been facing for generations. It was his destiny, and Kyo would have to face it. Same thing goes for several other endings. Iori's ending shows him promising to kill Kyo and all the Kusanagis, Team Fatal Fury's ending sees Geese talking about his plans to deal with that team, and that would play directly into the next game. Even the custom teams, a team made up of three random characters you pick, will still have an ending that hints at things to come. It also ends with the most hilarious wording in the entire series. Rugal defeated, King of Fighters 95 ends. Using the prize money, each member retired happily. 
at least until 1996, until to be continued? Oh God, I love that. Everything from the befeated to I don't know if this is going to continue to saying that everyone retired for the span of a year. There is so much good 90s arcade translations in such a short amount of time there. But as bad as that warning is, it does imply that SNK had plans already in place for next year. And boy did they ever. Because in this game, we just got a little tiny hint of the story. But in King of Fires 96, that story would become a defining element of the entire franchise. While I'm fighting to come again, as the year flew by from the excitement, now declare the opening of a special tape tournament again. In 1997. King of Fires 96 came out in July the next year, and while they did have a longer development cycle on this game, it's widely believed the staff was still busting their backs on it around the clock. Because unlike the last game that used many of the same graphics and only had one new team, King of Fires 96 featured multiple brand new characters and saw a decent graphical upgrade. The sprites all looked much better in this game. But that of course means that they had to remake all the sprites. Because of this, the developers were working up until the last minute. When they did the location test of this game just a few months before its release, they didn't even have the full roster available because they hadn't made everyone yet. Yeah, it was a race to meet this deadline, but they did it. And somehow, it's the best game yet. As I said, King of Fires 95 felt much better than 94, and 96 continued that trend. Doing combos feels far more natural. It feels more fun and free to experiment. And I no longer have to carefully reach out and poke the enemy with my big toe and hope they don't instantly kill me back because the difficulty finally feels like a normal fighting game. If you're going back and checking out these games for the first time and you find yourself stuck on 95 thinking, holy crap, when does this thing stop trying to eat all my quarters? KOF 96, that's when. And the game featured several new mobility changes that made your characters more agile and it makes this game finally feel like the king of fighters I was used to. You no longer dash forward, now you ran when you double tapped in a direction. Also, when you hit the two light buttons together, you no longer did your lean to the side. Instead, you rolled, giving you far better options for avoiding attacks and being able to mix up your opponents. And lastly, and maybe the most important addition in this game, a monumental adjustment that would go on to affect the entire history of this series, something that would revolutionize the fighting game world, Yes, King of Fires 96 introduced short hops and long jumps to this series. Long jumps being performed by simply pressing down, then up to leap further, but the short hops, which would be performed by giving your stick just a slight tap in a direction, would become one of the biggest defining gameplay elements of this series. Short hops might not look like much, but this allows you to control how quickly you get in on the opponent. It allows you to attack closer to the ground, which lets you link into a ground attack that you wouldn't normally be able to do from a normal jump. I know it's not the most impressive technique on paper, but the versatility of this move would revolutionize this series. Now when it comes to the presentation, I already said the sprites and the animation look much better and this was the first game in the series to introduce unique animations between characters before the matches, helping to give them some more personality and showing off their relations. Seeing Iori and Kyo stare each other down before the fight helped to add to their rivalry, and I have to mention Ralph and Clark striking Super Sentai poses, a running gag between the two of them that still comes up to this day. But if I had to point at a spot where they might have cut some corners, it would be the backgrounds. I said I always thought that the stages in King of Fighters looked great, but this is the one big exception to that. Don't get me wrong, there's still some good ones, especially the big final stadium that you fight in, complete with a cheering crowd and mascots dressed like KOF characters. That's such a charming touch. But this is one of the only games in the series where multiple teams have to share the same stages, and a lot of the background characters look... Oof. That is a man out of an MS-DOS choose-your-own-adventure game right there. But to give this game's presentation another compliment, the soundtrack is excellent. Some people have even said that this might be the best soundtrack in the entire series, and I think I might have to agree with them. 
the rising motivated beats of Kim's themes, the heavy electric rock of Team Ikari's theme, and of course, Iori's legendary saxophone number. There's so many jams in here. The only games in this series that I think might have better soundtracks are the ones that just did covers of all the songs in this game. And as for the cast, this was the first game to really mix things up. Team Fatal Fury, Psycho Soldiers, Korean Justice, and the Hero Team all stayed the same. Although it is worth pointing out that Kyo saw some changes, losing his projectile attack and having it replaced with a three-hit Rekka. In fact, he wasn't the only one to lose a projectile. This game is referred to by many King of Fires fans as the game that hates projectiles, because many of the characters either completely lost projectiles or had them transformed into big blast effects with very short range. But when it comes to the rest of the teams, they were all shifted around. The Art of Fighting team lost Takuma and gained Yuri, which was actually set up in their ending in the last game. But now that Yuri was on the Art of Fighting team, Team Women Fighters needed a new member. So they add Kasumi Toto from Art of Fighting 3. She was the daughter of Ryu Hakutoto, a character from the very first Art of Fighting who was a master of a rival dojo to the Koku Genryu school. And when her father went missing, she went looking for Ryo, believing that he might have something to do with it. She's a fairly studious young girl trying to do her dad's dojo proud, and she's also constantly practicing her English, which is why her win animation sees her pointing out a pocket dictionary and attempting to badmouth the opponent. We know it's Come back when you grow up. In fact, a fun little Easter egg, if you play as Kasumi in the bar stage, you can see her dad in the background cheering her on. And that's not the only Easter egg on this stage. These arcade machines were capable of keeping track of the date. So if you fought on this stage on Halloween, there would be a jack-o'-lantern in the background. It's not much, but it's actually the very first date activated Easter egg in a fighting game. And I think it might be one of the earliest date-activated easter eggs in a game, period. It's certainly the earliest one that I've been able to find. Next big change, Hydern left Team Ikari, and taking his spot was his daughter, Leona. Hydern found Leona on a mission years ago, the only survivor of a village where everyone had been mysteriously killed. He took her in, raised her, and trained her in all of his fighting styles, so she shares a lot of moves in common with him, but she also has a few of her own, including a big spiral ball that if it catches your opponent, just decimates their life points while you can still run around and continue doing damage to them. Leona is another big fan favorite character, and she's also one of the more important characters to this franchise's story, for reasons that will become clear in a moment. And lastly, after the ending of King of Fires 95, let's just say that Billy and Naiji did not want to work with Iori again. So, he needed to find some new partners for this tournament. So one day, two new mysterious fighters appeared before him, Mature and Vice who said that they could help him with his goals. Now, I say they're new because they've never been playable before, but they have actually been in the previous games. You see, Mature and Vice were Rugal's assistants in the cutscenes in 94 and 95. The two of them are malicious, they're deadly, and they enjoy bloodshed enough to risk teaming up with a guy who almost killed his previous teammates. But why would they want to fight side by side with Iori in the first place? Well, that's because they were secretly already working for a brand new boss. A new villain who was pulling everyone's strings and needed to make sure that Yori was at this tournament. But before we get to that, we should mention the one completely brand new team. The final team that you face in the arcade ladder, and one of the teams that got cut from the last game. Team Bosses, made up of three final bosses from other SNK games. Geese Howard, the man who killed Terry's father and crime lord of Southtown, Geese's brother Krauser, who is the head of his own Assassin's Guild, and Mr. Big, Geese's former underling and now a competing gang leader. I've already talked a little bit about each of these characters in this video, but I will say their stage is easily one of the best in this entire game, and I love that each of these characters get their own theme song from their respective games playing behind them. Just another example of how good this soundtrack is. Now after beating Team Big Bad Bosses, you make your way to the championship stage, where you meet the new mysterious figure hosting this year's King of Fighters, Chizuru Kagura. She says she put this tournament on because she wanted to meet the person who defeated Rugal. She reveals that Rugal died not because of the battle, but because he had absorbed a fraction of the power of Orochi and he couldn't control it and destroyed him. Now, you probably have several questions right now. Number one of which being, what's an Orochi? Okay, this is the part of the show I'm sure many of you have been waiting for. You see, I've been talking this whole time about how SNK won this series to have a big story behind it, and this is the moment that comes into play. And the crazy thing is, just like with Fatal Fury before it, 
a massive chunk of this story and the information that you need to know in order to understand what the heck is going on isn't even in the game. No, instead, it was in promotional material released by SNK before the game's release. Heck, before you fight the final boss of the game, Kyo references that the two of them already fought. Which happened where? Not in this game, that's for sure. So I will now attempt to give you the concise, succinct summary of what the heck King of Fighters is about. Almost 2,000 years ago, Gaia, the will of the Earth itself, decided, hey, you know what? These humans, don't like them. They're building stuff on me and cutting down my trees. Don't care for that. So the deity Orochi was born to wipe mankind out. But some humans were actually on Orochi's side, going so far as to form a clan to worship Orochi. This clan was known as the Hekeshu, and they began waging war on all humans who weren't down with the whole worshipping a genocidal snake god thing. So three human clans came together, the Kusanagi, the Yasukani, and the Yata, and they used three mystic treasures to seal Orochi away. The Kusanagi had a sword, the Yata had a mirror, and the Yasukani had a magatama. These treasures were passed down through their families so they could always be prepared to lock Orochi away if he ever returned. Well, unfortunately for these clans, the Hekeshu were still around, and they spent the next thousand years plying revenge, and they finally figured out a way to destroy the alliance of the three sacred treasure families. They murdered the wife of the leader of the Yasukani clan and framed the Kusanagis for it. And so, the Yasukani leader went to the dormant Orochi and asked it for its power in order to get revenge. Now, the Kusanagis and the Yasukanis both had the ability to create flames, but after the Yasukani leader absorbed the power of Orochi, his flames turned purple. His hatred for the Kusanagi clan then became tied to his powers, so this hatred would forever be passed down throughout his family. And he even abandoned his ties to the sacred treasure clans completely by dropping the name Yasukani and taking on the name Yagami. Cut to the modern day when a man named Gainus, who was one of the four legendary kings, a title given to the highest ranking officials of the Hekeshu, finds Rugal and defeats him, even removing his eye, but says that he finds him to be intriguing, so he grants Rugal a taste of Orochi's power, and he entrusts two other members of the Hekeshu, Mature and Vice, to watch over him. Rugal couldn't contain the power and it eventually destroyed him. Gainets proceeds to kill the head of the Yada clan, Chizuru's father, which weakened the seal around Orochi. Now, all he needed to do was kill the remaining members of the Sacred Treasure families. So, after ambushing Kyo and beating him with ease, he left him for dead, but Kyo was able to pull through and barely survive. Chizuru realizes that the Hikeshu are making their move, so she needs to get the Kusanagi and the Yagami family to come together. And the only way she can get the two of them together in the same place is with the King of Fighters tournament. So she sponsors the new tournament, but Gainitz, now finding out that Kyo survived, realizes that he still has to kill all three of them, and he says, wait, King of Fighters? The place where all three of them are going to be at the exact same time? Well, isn't that convenient? So he calls up Mature and Vice and says, hey, you two are out of work now that Rugal is dead, right? Go find Iori and tell him that you'll enter the tournament with him so that way he can kill Kyo. As long as he gets to do that, he's not going to question anything else. So now you got Kyo's team, and you got Iori's team, all arriving at the championship together, only to find Chizuru there. After challenging them to test their power, she reveals to them the true purpose behind this tournament, which was to bring them all together in the same place, only for Gainage to pop up and say, hey, thanks for getting everybody together in the same place. So now you know the complete story of the Orochi saga all leading up to this battle. And one of the great things about this fight is that it's not just about Kyo and Iori. There are multiple other characters who get some major reveals going into this battle. For example, if you're playing as the Akari Warriors, then Gantt will reveal that Leona was actually a member of the Hekeshu, and she was the one that killed her own family when she was overwhelmed by the power of the Orochi blood. And this is a great example of one of my favorite things about the cast of King of Fighters. Everyone has their own stories, but those stories so often will cross over with each other, leading multiple characters to have connections with each other that you might have never suspected. From there you have to fight Gantt in the destroyed remains of the stadium, and remember how I said that many of the stages in this game took a hit in quality? Not this one, because this set is incredible. You can look at it all and clearly see that this was the big Colosseum stage that you were fighting in just a moment ago, but now in shambles. The entire arena is surrounded by a raging hurricane, letting you know how powerful Gainitz is. And my favorite little detail is just all the little props and characters flying around in the background. Like one of the costume mascots from the previous stage is now flying past and attempting to grab onto the pillars and hold on for dear life. There is so much going on in this stage, it's fantastic. Not that you'll be able to notice any of it because your attention is going to be laser focused on the big demon priest in front of you. 
Yeah, remember how I said Rugal in 95 was easier than Rugal in 94? That trend did not last. Gainet is arguably one of the toughest bosses in the entire King of Fighters series. I mentioned that with the two Rugals, a good strategy was just to maintain your distance and deliver pokes whenever you could, but there ain't no footsies here. He keeps you zoned out by summoning twisters across the stage. But if you get close to him, then he has a wide variety of slashes with solid range to keep you from attacking, and worst of all is his grab that does massive damage, and thanks to his speed and the fact that he can teleport, even if you try to stay outside of his range, his range is wherever he wants it to be. Gainitz is SNK boss syndrome at its finest. Now if you defeat Gainitz, then the game goes out with a really morbid note, as he uses his own wind powers to rip his body apart rather than face defeat and then each team proceeds to have their own individual endings. And you would assume that since Kyo's our hero, his team's ending would be the canonical one. And you'd be partially right, because actually little bits and pieces of several endings are important to the story. Especially Iori, because in his ending, after he learns about his family's connection to the Orochi, he's overwhelmed by what is known as the Orochi Blood Riot, a mindless violent frenzy that members of the Hekesho occasionally go into, and while in this rage state, he murders Mature and Vice. But the ending that's really important for this story isn't one with an established team. Yes, King of Fighters 96 was the first game to introduce something that later games would refer to as special edit teams, a unique combination of characters that would unlock something special if you beat the game with them. In later games, all you'd unlock would just be some artwork, but in this game, if you input a certain command on the select screen, you could unlock Chizuru to play as. Then, if you made a team of Chizuru, Iori, and Kyo, then you would get a special ending where the three of them come together to defeat Gainitz. Chizuru then asks the two of them to work together, but they both refuse and go off in their separate directions, leaving Chizuru to just stand there and say, All right, my family has sworn never to interfere in your feud, but Orochi is coming, and we're going to have to face him whether you're ready or not. And that confrontation would come sooner than she thought in... King of Fighters 97 would be the game that would bring the Orochi saga to an end. Yes, this was what the last three games had all been building to, the epic finale to a story years in the making. So what better time to completely change the gameplay? Yes, when you start the game, you're presented with two options, advanced or extra. If you pick extra mode, then the game plays like it did in 94 and 95, where you can perform a sidestep or you can charge up your super meter. But if you pick advanced mode, then it plays like it did in KOF 96, where you could do a roll to dodge attacks, and your meter couldn't be charged up, but it would fill up as you fought. But unlike in KOF 96, once you filled up the meter, it would now store that meter as one stock, and you could fill up a total of three stocks. So while you might not be able to charge up a meter to get an instant super, you could now perform three supers back to back if you had your stocks charged up. You can also burn a stock of your meter to roll out of an attack while blocking, but perhaps most importantly, you can also burn a stock to go into max mode. While in max mode, you can roll out blocks without burning any meter, and your attacks and defense are slightly increased. But probably the coolest thing about max mode is that any super you do while in this mode will be bigger and flashier. Now just speaking personally, I prefer advanced mode over extra mode any day of the week. I think the roll is far more useful than the sidestep, I enjoy having multiple stocks of resources I can use, but also I've always been a far more aggressive player, and advanced mode was made for aggression and extra mode was made for defense. In advanced mode, your meter built up from you doing damage. In extra mode, the meter was built up from you blocking. And I think that is so smart. Building two different systems for the two core fighting game mindsets? This is such a smart way to program these two meters. Here's where it gets really dumb. The game also introduced something called the social relation system, where when you decide the order of your characters, you can hold down start to see how much the characters like each other. If you're in advanced mode and you have two characters that like each other, if one of those characters is defeated, 
then the next one that comes out will receive an instant stock of meter. If those characters are bland towards each other, nothing changes. And if they're angry with each other, then you lose meter. Listen, I get the point of this. I get that this is a series that cares a lot about its war and the relationship between the characters, and as I point out, that's one of the things that makes these characters so good. But this idea falls flat on its face because it essentially punishes you for not caring about the lore. Oh, you didn't know these two characters hate each other when you chose them? Too bad. And when you really get down to it, one of the best things about this game on the competitive scene is that it encourages players to mix and match their favorite characters to form their own unique team. And this essentially discourages that. It tells you that it's a bad idea to put certain characters together, and that just goes against one of the biggest appeals of this game. Now as for the roster, Team Hero, Team Fatal Fury, Art of Fighting, Ikari, Psycho Soldiers, and Korean Justice all remain the same from the last game. As for the new additions, Mine King are joined on Team Women Fires by Chizuru. Yes, the sub-boss from the last game is now back with all of her crazy mirror duplication attacks and funky dance moves. But possibly the oddest team on this entire roster, Team Outlaws, made up of the returning Billy Kane, Ryuji Yamazaki, a psychotic killer for the mob who first appeared in Fatal Fury 3, and Blue Mary, a badass detective in Southtown, and Terry Bogart's on-again, off-again girlfriend. Which raises a very good question. Why the hell is she working with a serial killer and Geese Howard's number one subordinate? Well, for story reasons, it's because she was hired by a mysterious benefactor who wanted her to investigate the mysterious Orochi powers all circling around this tournament. Only for her to then learn her ending that this mysterious benefactor was really Geese Howard. No! The hell you say! Mary, you're a detective. How did you not realize this as soon as you saw Billy there? If you were in the DC universe and you were suddenly hired to work alongside a bunch of people dressed up like clowns, don't you think that maybe the Joker would be involved? But if you want the actual reason why Blue Mary was on this team, it's because to promote this new game, SNK held three popularity polls to find which characters from the Fatal Fury games would come together to form a team, which is why this team was originally referred to as Team Special. The polls were held in three different magazines, Neo Geo Freak, Famitsu, and Gamus. Neo Geo Freak's winner was Billy Kane, Famitsu's winner was Yamazaki, and Gamus' winner was Blue Mary, although she barely, just barely beat out Duck King by a handful of votes. And listen, I love Blue Mary, she's a great character, one of my favorite female characters in SNK's entire library, and I'm glad that she got into King of Fires one way or another. But Duck King actually was another enemy to Terry Bogard in those early games. He would have fit onto this team way better than Mary. But that being said, this is still a badass trio right here, so I guess I can't complain too much. The second all-new team was called the New Faces Team, because they were the first team where all three members were completely original creations made just for this game. These characters were Yashiro, a giant man with a personality large enough to match, Chris, a shy and cheerful young boy with fast slaps and kicks, and Shermie, a bubbly grappler with bangs so big they could give Zoe Deschanel a run for her money. The three of them were all in a band, CYS, based on the first initial of each of their names. However, one night, the club they were supposed to play at bumped them for Iori's band, which is maybe the only time that Iori's musical background actually plays into the plot of this series. The three of them knew he'd cost them their big break, so they swore revenge against him. And what better place to get revenge than the King of Fighters, a place where you're encouraged to beat the crap out of each other. Problem is, they didn't have an invitation. Hmm... Where could they get an invite? Where, oh where, could they find an invitation? If only there was someone out there that they could easily beat up and steal the invitation from- <laughs> Yep, after skipping King of Fires 96, the American sports team was all set for their big dramatic return only for them to get curb stomped and have their invitation stolen from them a second time, nobody knows the pain of being a Team American sports fan. You guys just want to add a baseball player from the Orioles on your squad really drive the point home. Now speaking of the new phase's sworn enemy, Iori was back, but this time he was competing by himself with no teammates, probably because he keeps trying to kill them all. This was a first for the franchise, and even though it was rare, there would be later installments that would also see single entry characters. In fact, he wasn't even the only single entry in this game. They also introduced the brand new character, Shingo Yabuki. You see, the creators of this game thought the storyline was getting pretty dark, so they wanted to add a character who could provide some levity. So they created Shingo, a good-natured goof who gets along with everyone. 
He's Kyo's number one fan who tries to duplicate all of his hero's moves, making him like the Kmart knockoff brand of Kyo with some fun little animations like stopping to check his notes to see what he should do next or having to take a breath and tell himself that he can do this before he goes into a match. They even gave him Kyo's alternate color pattern from the earlier games. Now, I know describing Shingo as a goof and a knockoff might sound like I'm looking down on this character, but Shingo is actually one of the biggest fan favorite characters in the entire series. People love this fighting fanboy. And while Shingo doesn't have a team ending, since he's, you know, not on a team, if you pair him up with Kyo, then he does get a secret ending where Kyo gives him his old gloves, which he would continue to wear in all his future appearances. And this isn't the only special ending that you can find by mixing and matching characters. The last game introduced the first special edit team, but this game expanded upon that and now there were several combinations you could come up with to unlock a short one panel ending with your custom team. For example, if you put Terry, Ryo, and Kyo on a team, then you get Team SNK Heroes. Speaking of Kyo, one final point of interest, remember how I said that in the last game Kyo had several changes to his gameplay, like losing his projectile and replacing it with Eureka? Well now, if you hold start as you select him, then you can play as EX Kyo, who uses all of his original moves. Now as for the presentation, the sprites still look solid and the stages are once again great, although I am a little upset that each team doesn't have their own unique stage. But the real thing that makes the game's presentation stand out is how every single fight and the transition between each match is set up to look like it's being covered on TV. You have this news logo popping up, you got the channel change transitions, I love it! As I said, one of the best things about the King of Fighters stages is that they have this energy to them, and there's always a big cheering crowd, and I love this because it makes this feel like a tournament. It makes it feel like this is all part of the biggest fighting competition on the planet, and making it look like you're watching all these fights on TV is a brilliant way to lean into that. But now that we've covered everything else about the game, it is time to see how the Orochi Saga ends. And as I mentioned earlier, each King of Fighters had one sub-boss followed by a final boss, but KOF 97 hits you with a barrage of battles before you get to the big guy. First up, as you're about to be crowned the winners, Iori appears and once again the Orochi Blood Riot takes control of him, and now you must face the possessed Orochi Iori, who runs around at an insane speed and is brutally aggressive. This is the most unga of unga bunga characters. However, if you have Iori on your team, then instead of facing Orochi Iori, Leona is hit with a flashback, remembering that she was the one that killed her family, but then Gainitz erased her memories, so that way, when Orochi was about to be revived, her true self would reawaken to serve him. And just like Iori, this is a much faster and more aggressive Leona. Although there is one notable difference between these two. Orochi Iori can only short hop, and Orochi Leona can only long jump. It's a small touch, but I think it's cool. Also, Orochi Leona runs like a cat. That's weird. But after you beat the Possessed Iori or Leona, the new Faces team pops back up, only now with a very purpley makeover. They reveal that Leona wasn't the only one with hidden memories, saying that Orochi has been feasting off everyone's energy as they fought, and now that he was close to returning to full power, their own memories had reawakened, and they learned that they too were descendants of the Hekeshu, and they were the remaining three members of the four legendary kings. Which just raises all kinds of questions, like, why were Orochi's top officers just hanging out in a band? Why did they have no memories of their past? What are the odds that they would end up having beef with Iori that would be completely unrelated to Orochi, but that would lead them to being in the same tournament where Orochi was going to be reborn, which would cause them to gain all their memories back? What would have happened if they'd never gotten bumped from that show? Would they still have shown up to the tournament? I'm probably asking way more questions than this game wants me to. Now, when the Possessed New Faces team confronts the heroes, multiple revelations are made. Almost each team learns something important during this moment. If you can read it, that is. I have no idea why, but for some reason the text speeds across the screen like chocolate in I Love Lucy sketch. It is so hard to read anything in these exchanges, and I thought it might just be a bad translation, like maybe because Japanese text is shorter than English text, the translators were trying to cram all that information into the same amount of time. But no, I looked up the original Japanese cutscenes, it's just as fast! This is the moment that the entire storyline has been building to, and everything is spelled out for us, and it's next to illegible. So, rather than try and read all of this, let me fill you in on a couple of the important revelations. In Team Outlaw's scene, it's revealed that the reason Yamazaki has a stretchy, super-powered arm is because he is also a member of the Hakeshu with the blood of Orochi in him, but the reason it doesn't take control of him like it does everyone else is because Yamazaki is too crazy to be controlled by it. That is actually the in-universe explanation for it. 
Yamazaki's crazy is stronger than a god. In the Akari Warriors cutscene, Leona learns that her father was a member of the Hakeshu, but he turned on them and moved far away to live in peace with his family away from the evils of the Oroji before Leona's powers awaken. And in Team Heroes scene, Yashiro tells Kyo that Orochi needs a sacrifice to come back to life, so they plan on sacrificing his girlfriend, Yuki. Yeah, remember her? After four years, she was finally important to the plot. This is a great example of how SNK really wanted this series to be a whole multimedia universe because Yuki and her relationship with Kyo is almost entirely from the mangas. If you didn't read them, you'd be lost right now. Also, this is a good enough time as any to point out something that I love about King of Fighters. They didn't just want to establish connections between each fighter, they wanted every character to have their own unique supporting cast. I already brought up Kyo and his girlfriend Yuki, but you've also got King and her younger brother that she watches over, Athena has a young fan who she helps to inspire and she keeps coming back for a couple of different games, and it keeps going on like this, with almost every single character having some kind of an example like this. And I love that, it's a great way of expanding the world of these games and making sure that every character feels like the hero of their own story. But this leads into the fight with the new faces, now going by the name Team Orochi. And they didn't just get a makeover, all of them have brand new moves. Chris now uses fire, Shermie can use electricity, and Yamazaki is now a heavy grappler. Sound familiar? Yeah, they're now each meant to be the evil counterparts to Team Hero. And this stage, I know I'm sounding like a broken record at this point, but I love this stage. You're standing over the site where Orochi was sealed thousands of years ago, and as you beat Chris, you see the rings start to break apart and lightning crackling as Shermie enters. Then when she's defeated, the entire stage is engulfed in flames and the earth begins to shake, lava bubbling up through the seal beneath your feet. This is an amazing way of using the stage to make you realize what's at stake, to make you realize how close to doomsday you are. With every passing battle, you can feel Orochi's arrival growing closer. But after being the three legendary kings, the day is saved. Orochi has been stopped. Doomsday is averted, so why is Yashiro smiling? Yeah, remember how they said that they were going to use the energy created from these fights to power up Orochi? Turns out this last battle against the Team New Faces was all they need to top him off. All they need now is a sacrifice, so Shermie and Yashiro volunteer and Orochi proceeds to possess Chris. This is it. This is the battle everything has been leading to. The one thing standing between this god and the extinction of all mankind is you and your team. Every fight has been preparing you for this moment, the most important battle of your life. And boy is it easy! Okay, it's not easy, it's still a boss fight in a King of Fires games. He can still do cheap zoning attacks, he can teleport, and he's got two super moves, one a full screen attack that does more than half your life if you're not blocking, and a grab where he tries to suck you into him, and give you a seizure. I'm slowing it down and darkening the screen, but trust me, it's brutal. I normally don't have problems with flashing lights, and even I had trouble looking at the screen. So yes, he is still tough, he still does cheap stuff, but compared to Rugal, to Gainitz, to almost every other boss in this series, he's way easier. I played this on the Orochi collection on the PS4, and just to give you an idea of the difficulty of this game, the trophy for being KOF 94 and 95 without using a continue, has a completion rate of 1.5%. KOF 97? 12.7%! That is one heck of an uptick. Now just like with KOF 96, there are multiple endings that include some valuable information. For example, the Akari Warriors ending sees Leona remembering that her father told her to not be defined by her Orochi heritage, and Ralph and Clark made her realize that she now has a new family in them, which is something that I'm just a sucker for. I always love those I lost my family but now I have a new one in my friends type of stories. And if you win with Team Heroes, then you see the team split up. A truly fitting end for their saga to see each of these characters going off in their own separate directions. Only to cut back to Kyo and Iori confronting each other, and then you get one final match. A one-on-one -on -one duel between these two rivals. That is a brilliant way for this story to end, and it's something that you never saw in fighting games back then. A story that had a post-credits fight scene? That's the kind of thing that you would get in modern day fighting game story modes, but in the mid 90s, that was unheard of. Seriously, going back and looking at all these KOF games has made me realize how far ahead of its time SNK was with this game's story. 
the links they thought everything out, the secret scenes that play out only if you have a certain team. Sure, sometimes there were plot points that felt a bit nonsensical, but nobody was doing anything like this at the time. And this post credits battle really shows off just how cinematic they want all this to feel. It's incredible. Too bad it's not canon, though. No, the canon ending is, once again, if you select Kyo, Chizuru, and Iori. In every other ending, Orochi says that he will go back to sleep, sort of making this less of a, you won, and more of a, it's someone else's problem now. But if you pick the Sacred Treasures team, then it looks like Orochi is going to win, as he activates the Blood Rite in Iori to force him to kill his teammates. Only for Iori to leap at Orochi and hold him still, screaming for Kyo to finish it all off. Kyo powers up charges in, unleashes his flames, and apparently kills not only Orochi, but also Iori, and himself. Well, okay, that's not actually what happens. We later learn Iori survived this attack, and Kyo simply passed out, and if you want to get really technical, even Orochi survived, as only his vessel was killed, and Chizuru was able to seal his power away again. But this ending is totally meant to make you think they died. The sad final look back from the tortured Iori, Kyo's vision fading as he literally goes into a white light and his last thoughts are of Yuki. Yeah, this has final moments written all over it. And not to jump too far ahead in what we're going to be talking about in part two of this video, but when the next storyline began in King of Fires 99, Kyo and Iori were there, but only as secret characters. They were not in the base roster. So just imagine that in 1997, you finish this story, you get the true ending, and it looks like our hero and his eternal rival died in a big gigantic explosion. And then in 1999, you go race into the arcade, shove your core into the machine so you can see what happened to them. And the two characters who may or may not have died in this game are no longer there. Unless, of course, you count these two Kyo's, but they're not actually Kyo, they're clones of Kyo, and yeah, the next storyline is gonna get weird, folks. But again, imagine building up a storyline around two characters over the course of four games, then making it look like they died at the end of their story. Now imagine doing that in a fighting game, a genre that in the 90s was not known for stories. This was incredibly bold and way ahead of its time. And that was it. The original King of Fighters saga had come to an end. But before the next storyline could begin, there was one more game that came out that would also start another tradition for this franchise. After spending four years pumping out one game after another, the SNK developers need a bit of a break before they head into their next storyline. But, what were you going to do? Go a year without pumping out King of Fighters? This series had a date in the title. You can't go from 97 to 99. You've kind of trapped yourselves. So SNK decided to make 98 a dream match, which if you were paying attention earlier is the term SNK uses for this is not canon. And because it wasn't canon, there was no story and no new characters. Instead, they brought back everyone from the previous games except for Aiji, Kasumi, the three members of Team Boss, and the actual bosses except for Rugal. But they did bring back Team American Sports, which is the last time I'm ever going to be able to say those words, so enjoy it while you can, folks. Also, a brand new team was created for this game out of pre-existing characters as Takuma, Hyder, and Saishu created the Masters Team, a team made up of older characters who all train the younger fighters. It's a cool idea for a team that many fans have wanted to see in a canonical game, 
Also, just like how in 97 you could play as an alternate version of Kyo that played like his classic version, you can now do the same for several other characters, including playing as the Orochi version of the New Faces team, mean in the end, including the alternate versions of characters, this game boasted a whopping 50 fighters. And while there was no story, meaning there was no ending for anyone, you would unlock artwork if you beat the game with an established team or with a special edit team. Of which there were now a ton. There were so many special secret teams that you could form by mixing and matching characters together, and some of them have just flat out weird themes tying them together. Such as Team Cap, made up of characters who wear... Caps. Then the April 8th team, made up of characters who have April 8th birthdays. And the baseball team, made up of characters whose favorite sport is baseball, including Ralph Jones, Blue Mary, and Lucky Glover, the professional basketball player. Lucky, you just didn't make a lot of smart life choices, did you, man? And while this game didn't feature any new characters, it did introduce maybe the most famous version of Rugal in the series as the final boss. The developers figured if this was supposed to be the return of the biggest KOF names, then they had to bring Rugal back because he just felt like the embodiment of King of Fighters bosses. Again, there's no story here, so they don't need to worry about explaining how he came back to life. So instead, they just decided to get weird with it. You find yourself back inside the Black Noah, now underwater, and having undergone a redesign from H.R. Giger. Everything is black, loaded with skulls, there's a pit of blood for some reason. Yeah, SNK won Rugal to feel like he crawled his way back out of hell. And you know what? Mission accomplished. This is legitimately creepy. As for how he plays, it's basically just Rugal all over again, except he's smarter, more aggressive, and I swear that Genocide Cutter's range is even higher than before. If he catches you jumping at just the right angle, he can punt you into space. Now as for the gameplay, it's the same rules as KOF 97, except they tweaked it to feel even better. At least, that's what most people agree upon. Most fans say that the combos, while not being as long and detailed as later games, were incredibly satisfying. Because of this, KOF 98 continued to be played and see competitive tournament entries for years, far longer than any other King of Fire games. I mean, people still play this in tournaments today. Although, they don't necessarily play this version of the game. King of Fighters 98 saw multiple re-releases. In fact, almost each of the games that we talked about today ended up getting some kind of a re-release throughout the years, and they are worth talking about because many of them did add something new to the games, and we will talk about them in part 4 when I get to the spin-offs and one-shots. However, King of Fighter 98's re-releases deserve some special attention. The first one came out on the Dreamcast with 3D backgrounds and a solid 90s anime intro the very next year, calling itself King of Fighters Dream Match 99. The game didn't sell all that well though, probably because it was a re-release of a game that came out just a year earlier, possibly because it came out on the Dreamcast, a console that was not known for high sales, and maybe, just maybe, because it was called King of Fighters 99. Boy, I sure hope there wasn't another game released literally within a month of this game also called King of Fighters 99 that could possibly have confused customers. But nine years after that, in 2008, SNK put out a proper re-release of the game called King of Fighters 98 Ultimate Match, and this game right here, this is some good stuff. The gameplay feels just as good as it did in the original 98 release, but now there's new mechanics that spice things up in really creative ways. Just as before, you can pick Advanced Mode and Extra Mode, but now you can pick Ultimate Mode, and in Ultimate Mode, it lets you fully customize how you want to play. Would you rather have chargeable meter or stocks? Would you rather run or dash? Would you rather sidestep or roll? This is great because while I do prefer advanced mode, I will admit being able to charge your meter has its advantages. And some people out there might prefer being able to mix things up with every single match. I mentioned before that one of the reasons why this game was so great on the competitive scene is because you could go up against a hundred different players and they could all use a different combination of characters. Now you could go up against someone who used the exact same combination of characters and they would still play completely different from you. And the game now felt like the full salute to the Orochi Saga as every single character was back, including multiple new EX alternate versions of characters and all the bosses from the previous games. Yes, after spending hours upon hours of getting my ass handed to me by these characters, it felt really good to play as Orochi and just spam the crap out of his stage clearing attacks. After all this time, now I was the SNK boss syndrome. 
and it used the 3D backgrounds from the Dreamcast game, and I have to admit, I know that by today's standards they look corny, but I actually kind of like them. I mean, yeah, they didn't age all that well, but I find them kind of nostalgic. Like, these just feel like Dreamcast backgrounds to me. And Rugal Stage now has a giant, poorly CGI'd Badge of the Future 2 Jaws shark in it. I love it. And the Ultimate Match Edition add even more special edit teams with unique artwork that you can unlock, and boy were they running out of team ideas at this point. Probably the two most bizarre ones I unlocked were Team Grown Arms, made up of characters with stretchy arms, and Team Detest Shingo, made up of characters who hate Shingo. And if that wasn't enough for you, there was one more version of this game that was released on Steam in 2014. King of Fighters 98 Ultimate Match Final Edition. And the most notable thing about this version is that it included an online mode that used rollback netcode and plays silky smooth so now you can challenge anyone around the world to this classic. So, what started off as a random wild idea the company had to bring two games together became SNK's longest running series, going from a one-time experiment to an annual tradition. It created several memorable characters, gave multiple older icons a second chance at life, and revolutionized storytelling in fighting games in a way that is still being felt to this day. And when the book was finally closed on the Orochi Saga, they then launched a game that would be one of the biggest competitive fighters SNK would ever put out and has a lifespan that is still going to this day. This was truly an incredible start to this legendary franchise. And with the amount of momentum behind it, with the critical praise and diehard audience that was growing around it with every single installment, I'm sure that when the next storyline began, it would continue this success and would usher in a golden era for SNK. Or the company would spiral downward so fast that they would collapse and lose the rights to their own flagship titles. But that couldn't possibly happen, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in to part one of this insane undertaking. This is easily the longest fighting game retrospective I've ever done, and I'm just at part one, and that wasn't a tease there at the end. Trust me, things are about to get even wilder in part two. So if you wanna see what all that's about, then make sure that you click that subscribe button and ring that bell and follow us on Twitter at Thorgy's Arcade so you know when the next episode is coming up. If you did enjoy this episode, just gonna throw it out there, but maybe share it around the web. If you know someone or someplace that might enjoy this video, make sure that you post it around. I know it doesn't seem like much, but it really is the best way to help this channel grow. And every time that I see you guys out there sharing these videos around, it really does make me feel better. Thank you all so much. So thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you all enjoy this episode. Stay safe out there and come back next time.